Welcome. It's October already, so it must be time to do a solar cycle update for September of 2023. It has been a relatively quiet month. We had 33 new sunspot regions that were numbered by NOAA. The sunspot number varied from 80 to 200 during the month. The average sunspot number for the month was 136, which is an increase of 16% over the last month. We had 249 C flares, that's an increase of 35%. We had 33 M flares, that's an increase of 38%. And 181 CMEs, and that's an increase of 15%. We also had some nice geomagnetic storms. So let's take a look at the sunspot numbers. Yellow is the daily sunspot number. Blue is the monthly average sunspot number. And you can see the last month it jumped slightly. And then the red curve, the solid red curve is the most important one here. That's the smooth sunspot number. And that's a sunspot number that's averaged over 13 consecutive months. And it's that quantity that is used to determine when solar maximum is and when solar minimum is. So it's a very important number to understand. It's a little unclear to see in that plot, so I've replotted it here. This is the smooth sunspot number through the first 40 months of this cycle. So that means that because it's a smooth sunspot number over a 13 month period, the most recent point we have is from March of 2023. You can see there's been a steady increase in this number over the last two years and is now past solar cycle 24 by 5%, being at 121. This throws a crimp in all of the arguments about a grand solar minimum. Now, if it carries on at this rate, if, if it takes us six more months, say, to get to solar maximum, the maximum will be about 145. If it takes us another year, it'll be about 160. And if it takes us two years, like the models claim, it'll be over 200. There have been various models of the solar cycle uh, derived, and the one that's been causing the most controversy is the NASA NOAA panel model, shown here in red, with the gray either side of it being the uncertainty on the model at that time. You can see that the sunspot number, that's the A plot here, is outperforming the model by quite a significant margin and continues to do so. The radio F 10.7 centimeter flux is also a way above the model. And so those two observations are agreeing with one another that the model is predicting a very much an underperformance compared with the reality of this cycle. Now, who knows when it will peak and when it will drop back down again. But at the moment, it is the fact that the cycle is beating the estimates that we had before. Both of those quantities are already higher than the equivalent time in solar cycle 24. In fact, in higher than the peak of solar cycle 24. So we've already determined that solar cycle 25 will be larger than solar cycle 24. And both curves are still rising. There are three models of the Solar Influences Data Center used. There is a so-called standard curves model, which is shown here on the left. It peaks in about April of 2024 at about a sunspot number of 190. That's just using the standard shape of solar cycles over the last uh, 24 cycles. There's another one which is called the combined method, which uses several different estimates, and that's shown here in green. And that peaks out in September of 2024 with a sunspot number that will be at least greater than 145. And then there is the McNish-Lincoln method, which gives maximum in September of 2024 also, and a sunspot number of greater than 150. So it seems we are in for a significantly larger cycle this time around. Let's take a look at a movie of the sunspots for the month of September. We're going to use the Solar Dynamics Observatory HMI instrument, visible light channel. We're going to show 30 days, that's the 1st to the 30th of September, of course. And one second on this video equals about six hours. The things to look at the for in the video are newly emerging sunspots, decaying sunspot regions, and sunspot motions within a group. It's those motions 
the collision of sunspots and the twisting of sunspots that build up the energy to cause flares. Next, we should look at some of the flare parameters. This is the number of C flares. This is the smallest category of significant flares that we have. And we've had over 4,000 of them so far this cycle, compared with just over 2,000 in the last cycle. That's a 92% increase in, over the same period of time. And it would take another 18 months of our sun having no C flares at all for solar cycle 24 to overtake it. We can do the same thing with M flares. These are 10 times larger flares than the C flares. And solar cycle 25 is beating solar cycle 24 by 113%, so over a factor of two. It would take solar cycle 25 going dormant for the next 24 months for solar cycle 24 to catch up with it, which again is exceedingly improbable. In fact, we've just had two M flares so far in October. So I could do the same thing with X flares, but there have been so few of them, the comparison between the two cycles is uh, basically a uh, meaningless statistically. So let's take a look at a flare movie. We're going to go with the Solar Dynamics Observatory AIA instrument at 94 angstroms. That's a picture taken at about 6 million degrees Kelvin, so it's very hot material. Again, it's going to be a 30 day movie. One second here equals three hours. What you're looking for is impulsive sudden brightenings, which indicate regions that are growing, or long lasting brightenings, which are called long duration events that are associated with coronal mass ejections. So enjoy.
Speaking of coronal mass ejections, we can do a comparison of the rate of those. Uh, here is solar cycle 25 in orange and solar cycle 24 in deep blue. And again, solar cycle 25 is outperforming the solar cycle 24 numbers, but not as much as the uh, C flares and M flares were doing. This is only uh, an increase of about 30%. But it would still take solar cycle 25 going dormant for eight months before solar cycle 24 would overtake its current number. So let's take a look at a coronal mass ejection movie. We're going to use the SOHO C2 coronagraph here, and that will be for the same 30 days. And, and it's a fairly large really The dark circle in the middle is the occulting disk. The sun is about half that size to give you some idea of scale here. Another very important parameter here is total solar irradiance, which I haven't covered very much in the past. But here's a plot of total solar irradiance during the first part of solar cycle 25. You can see it was at minimum through 2019, 2020, and has been steadily growing ever since. This is data from Colorado University. TSI increased from 1361.5 watts per meter squared to 1362.8 watts per meter squared. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, it's only 0.1%, but that's a fairly significant thing for the Earth. You can see there's the number of dips here that I've pointed out, and that's what happens when a large sunspot goes across the sun, and that actually cuts the total solar radiance for the one or two weeks that it's on the disk. You can see here at the bottom of that, figure, the total solar radiance is just bubbling along. And then as this sunspot comes onto the sun, the total solar radiance drops significantly. And then after it starts going towards the limb, it, it recovers slowly. We had six geomagnetic storms during the month of September. They ranged in size from G1, that's a, a very mild one, to G3, which is a strong one. And you, this is the timing of those. You can see them here. Uh, the KP index of 5 indicates a G1, KP index of 6 indicates a G2, 7 a G3, and anything above that, 8 uh, is G4, and uh, 9 is G5, and those are the really big events. We can expect a lot more of these in the coming years. I've been tracking in both hemispheres where the sunspots are and watching their march towards the equator. As the solar cycle goes along, they start at high latitudes and slowly get closer and closer to the equator. And when they get to the equator, that signals the beginning of solar minimum. Now you can use this timing to determine when solar minimum will be, at least roughly. So that's what I've done here. All you've got to do here is solve for y equals zero, which is a very simple equation. And that says that we will reach the equator in the Northern hemisphere 
20.5 months after solar minimum, which would be January of 2030. Similarly for the Southern Hemisphere, we get 121.5 months, which would be February of 2030. So in effect, these two estimates agree to within half a month, which is remarkable. So that would imply that solar minimum will be something like 2030 to 2031. Hence, the solar maximum will be in March of 2024. That you, what you do here is the average rise time for a solar cycle is 4.4 years for an 11 year cycle. So you just scale the 11 year cycle by a 10.5 year cycle, and that puts it at 4.2 years, which will give us March of 2024. That's earlier than most people are saying. It also will say, if we use that formula that we worked out earlier, to be about 160 for the maximum. So what conclusions can we draw from all of this? Solar cycle 25 is continuing to build up. We haven't reached solar maximum yet. And we won't know that we've reached solar maximum until six months to a year afterwards. And that's assumed that's only going to be one peak. If there's multiple peaks, we won't may not know for years. The maximum will be based on the current numbers, will be something like in 2024 or 2025, perhaps even early 2024. The maximum will be something like 130 to 200, probably with the best guess around about 160. The solar cycle 25, 26 minimum will be in 2030, and probably towards the end 2031. So this all says that there is no grand solar minimum uh, anytime soon. So thank you for watching. And also, until next time, stay safe and goodbye.